how is technology transforming cities today? What we're seeing in cities uh, is uh, something very interesting. We have basically new economic models coming into existence. We also see old practices, old political practices, like prioritization of infrastructure continuing. And they're continuing because of technology in entirely new ways. So it becomes possible to manage infrastructures remotely, becomes possible to charge differentiated prices, becomes possible to exploit assets and utilize assets in ways that were not uh, possible before. Uh, that, of course, left uncontrolled uh, and left without any kind of governance in the interests of citizens would only aggravate uh, existing inequalities that exist in cities. Uh, in addition, of course, we are seeing uh, practices like the sharing economy, which is not a term I prefer, but it's a term nonetheless that I think captures some of the dimensions uh, of this uh, changing environment because of technology, with Uber and Airbnb entering cities and offering to provide alternatives to transportation services, uh, offering to provide alternatives to hotels. Uh, that clearly is another dimension uh, that left unchecked uh, might result in fact to the weakening of public transportation options in the case of Uber and to even greater speculation uh, on real estate in the case of Airbnb. You've spoken in your before about how cities could be crushed by their own citizens if they don't tackle this, um, the, the provision of services by tech by new technology mm -hmm. companies. Can you expand sure. on this? Well, in a sense, in the 1970s, we see the rise of finance and consumer credit uh, as political tools and mechanisms promoted and embraced by governments. So it was basically done in order to decouple citizens from the existing basis of loyalty and support and solidarity, which were trade unions, and to more or less hook them up uh, to the uh, financial markets. So your well-being now will no longer be judged by how well your trade union defends you and how well you relate to your fellow workers, rather it will be judged by where the stock markets are, what the interest rates are, how cheaply you can borrow and how much you can invest into real estate, right? And the idea was that because of low interest rate environment, the rates, the uh, values of assets, especially houses, will continue going up. So that has given us an environment now where the kind of old Keynesian welfare state, whereby you know, we would be provided with some free services, we would be entitled to some kind of a job that actually pays us, has been replaced by this privatized Keynesianism, whereby the roles that have previously been played by the welfare state and public services have been delegated more or less to the financial markets. So our well-being is to be guaranteed by constantly growing uh, value, uh, which of course is a bubble, but nonetheless of our real estate, and not through some kind of actual performance and growth in the economy, in the so-called real economy, the productive sector. So that has created a situation where people now that they discover that they no longer can afford to pay for services, their job no longer brings the money that they want, interest rates are virtually at zero, so your savings no longer gives you the money that you want. They discover that you know taking advantage of the real estate that some of them are lucky to have is basically the only welfare recognized and guaranteed uh, by the current neoliberal uh, capitalism. So that has resulted not just in them speculating on real estate markets and putting their properties on the market and selling them after holding it for four or five years has also created an environment where they're increasingly renting out the apartments on a short-term basis, which is where services like Airbnb come in really handy. I mean, they do provide a way and a vehicle for people to uh, compensate for their stagnating or disappearing incomes from their real jobs with the speculative bubble that now you can also ration in short periods and put your property on the market to be rented uh, national, uh, on a short-term basis. That, of course, is a national, and I would even say in Europe, a European policy. This is why we have interest rates that are so low. That's why we have European Central Bank engaged in quantitative easing. This is why, more or less, the macroeconomic factors uh, make it possible for people to continue gaining money on real estate that is completely decoupled from the performance of the real economy. Now, if a city doesn't want to be entirely run out or you know, kind of crushed by this uh, real estate speculation, 
And clearly we see that the effects of it are everywhere. In Barcelona, you can see that, you know, there are more and more tourists flooding the city, you know, real estate uh, powerhouses are buying more and more property, putting it out on, re on uh, platforms like Airbnb. They're no longer renting it short term, they're no longer renting it long term. It's all about short term speculation, which also limits the pool of assets available to citizens. Of course, that generates some resistance from non-property owning classes, which push cities to basically do something about Airbnb. The problem is that if cities start doing something about Airbnb, that will alienate them against the working classes which have managed to buy property. So that creates an environment where cities basically are presented with the inviolable task of having to basically solve the problem created by the bubble-prone capitalism, which cities, of course, are not in a position to tackle. There is no way for cities to reverse privatized Gainsanism itself. So uh, this is where I think cities have to actually work within the limits imposed on them by the national and global system, and they have to find ways to limit the ways in which these platforms serve the interests of global real estate capital uh, and that actually do not amplify the already speculative practices that exist in cities, but rather seek to channel them to a somewhat less speculative financialized model. So people should be able to rent their apartments for short periods of time and make up some cash as a way to compensate for the weakened and stagnating economy, but that should not be turned into a highly speculative vessel. So regulating Airbnb or banning it, I don't think that's the right uh, step uh, under these conditions. So if the smart city works only on sensors and connectivity, how can cities, why are cities an important site for anti-capitalist resistance? Well, smart cities to me is just a, comp it's, it's a combination in essence of infrastructure for managing assets, right? And managing access to assets because many of the assets within cities have been privatized. So the property owners and the infrastructure owners need a way to measure the returns, they need to measure use, they need to introduce differentiated pricing, all of that requires smart infrastructure of sensors and connectivity. Now, uh, clearly, a lot of people are very unhappy about it, not just because the privatization of infrastructure uh, means that the current owners of it usually have a very short-term perspective. They want to generate the maximum of returns that they can and then just drop the asset on somebody else and then move somewhere. Right? So basically it creates uh, an environment where there is systemic underinvestment in long-term infrastructural planning and resources, this equity, private equity funds that uh, purchase this infrastructure, hold it for 10 years, what they do, what they call sweat the asset, they try to generate as much value as they can in the short period of time and then they drop it like a hot potato. Clearly, a lot of it also generates uh, huge losses. If you look at privatization of highways uh, in the United States and the way in which a lot of highway tolls uh, have been taken over by big financial capital, none of that delivers the expected returns. But the firms that are doing it gain quite a lot of money because they earn their money on fees paid to them by governments. They do not earn their money from fees from actual customers. So the private equity sector and the infrastructure well, asset sector always wins, right? But of course, it clearly makes a lot of citizens unhappy because the infrastructure doesn't function and they increasingly have to pay more and more to use it. So infrastructure as an important component of the city itself becomes a site of struggle. Right? And smart city as a kind of infrastructure for managing that infrastructure itself becomes a political terrain. This is why I think we have to be able to find a way to democratize the smart city, but that can only be done if we understand that the reason why there is so much interest in smart cities is precisely because there are all those other processes, prioritization of infrastructure, some kind of rise of urban entrepreneurialism that David Harvey has been talking about for 20 years. All of those are processes that basically have created the background conditions responsible for the rise of the smart city. And those conditions need to be tackled themselves. We cannot just expect that by somehow generating an alternative vision for the smart city will reverse decades of privatization of infrastructure that you know, is a very hard process to reverse. To reverse. To reverse. To reverse. To reverse.